Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the Lead X Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. Hello, everyone. I am Kevin Cruz. Welcome back to the Lead X Leadership Show, where we help you to become the boss everyone wants to work for. And maybe I'm welcoming myself back because we've been mixing it up with some educational webinar episodes, but I'm back with an awesome guest interview today. We're going to go deep into how to think better, how and why we need to carve out that deep work focus time and more. But first, we've been busy at LeadX. Did you know that we just launched the new and improved LeadX with Coach Amanda? Now it's available on the iPhone, like always, on the website, like always, and we just launched Android. And LeadX is a platform to help you both change your behaviors and to learn new things as a leader and a manager. So learn about leadership and then it helps you to apply it back on the job. The platform includes weekly behavioral nudges, very cool, sent to your phone or email. We have over a thousand micro learning videos, webinars, podcasts, job aids, and more. And we just updated the new Coach Amanda bot. We screwed up. Uh, I'll take the blame. I got to say sorry, because about a month ago, we released an update to consolidate the interface and it made it worse instead of better. And so as quickly as we could, we fixed it. And now when you click on that icon for Coach Amanda, she just says, hey, do you want to uh, have me teach you something? Do you want some coaching? Or you can just ask me a question and then you just tap teach me, coach me, or you type your questions. So there's three different modes, really clear and very cool. You can start your free seven day trial, even if you just wanna check it out. Even if you wanna get a free personality assessment from IBM Watson, go to leadx.org and sign up for that free seven day trial. Our guest is the founder and CEO of the Pontefract Group. It's a firm that improves the state of leadership and organizational culture. He's the best-selling author of The Purpose Effect and Flat Army. He's presented at four different TED events. I am so jealous I haven't spoken at TED yet. I've got I've to make that a priority. He also writes for Forbes, Harvard Business Review, The Huffington Post. He's a professor at the University of Victoria and was previously chief learning officer at TELUS. Now, they're a Canadian telecommunication company. If you don't know them, they have revenues of $14 billion dollars and 50,000 global employees. This guy has done it all. Here is my fun, casual chat with my brother from another mother, Dan Pontefract. Dan, welcome back to the LeadX show. Kev, I should call you Rev Kev. I am uh, <laughs> I'm a disciple in your world of leadership, man. Thank you for what you do. Oh, you know, so we were we were uh, talking um, before we we started recording about we had to reschedule this several times, and partly because you went into the hospital. I, I, it was like two days before our interview, and I think on Facebook, I'm like, "Is that Dan in a hospital gown?" <laughs> yeah, talk about open kimono. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, you know Canadian Thanksgiving. Uh, we're a little bit ahead of you, so we like celebrating six weeks earlier. And uh, on that Sunday night at three in the morning, I keeled over and uh, Denise heard the thud on the bedroom floor and wondered uh, what had happened to her husband. And next thing you know, I am rushed to the hospital and they took out a gallbladder that had leaked uh, poison into the stomach lining. And oh my gosh, two things. A, if you have this gnawing sensation in your stomach for like a few months, maybe go get it checked out. <laughs> so it turns out I had chronic coleocystitis. Oh. But second, if you're looking, Kevin, to you know win back or lose a quick 15 pounds, get your gallbladder out. It's fantastic. Oh man, I was you know you answered the question I was going to ask, which is like, did this just come out of the blue? Because we talk about dropping to the floor, but you had a sense that something weird was going on for a little while. 
Yeah, I, I don't ever want anyone to suggest I suffer from man flu. <laughs> and so I was ignoring it. I'm like, yeah, I know, I can't complain about this. <laughs> so, you know, that's not the advice I'm recommending for anyone and listening in today. You took one for the, for the man team. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to tough exactly. this out. Exactly. <laughs> now, in addition to that unexpected health news, I was surprised you recently went out on your own. Tell me about that big change. Man, you know, uh, you're so kind to ask these really good personal questions uh, because it means a lot when people are like you. We've known each other for year, years and, and to ask that on a podcast like that means a lot. It means you care, you're empathetic and you're listening in. You're like, hey, maybe people want to hear about that story. So here's the quick nuts. In the Christmas season or holiday season of 2017, Denise and I and our three goats, as we affectionately call them, uh, were in Australia. And we're touring around the country and having a great old time, right? And... I reread my second book, which was about purpose. And I was coming into my 10th year at TELUS, kind of like the AT&T of Canada. And I had been the chief learning officer. I was its chief envisioner, having a grand old time in that organization. But when I reread the book, it's really a book about uh, centering in on your sweet spot, a, a, a sense of purpose between you in life and you at work, more or less. And as much as I was having such a grand old time at TELUS, doing great things, I said to myself, well, Dan, you turned 47 this year. You've written three books. Is there something more in your life that you might want to be doing? And can you help others? And so towards the 2018 year, on December the 8th, it would have been my 10th anniversary. And so I worked with our chief corporate officer at TELUS. I said, you know what? I'd love to leave, but I'd still like to stay. How can we make this work? And... So to speed the story up, uh, we figured it out where I go out on my own and I get to be that kind of Dan Pontifrac, author, speaker, consultant guy. And I'm loving it, you know, six weeks in. Uh, but I also have two feet in the door still with TELUS. I'm the director of its TELUS MBA, which I initiated and love. So I get to do that for, you know, 10 days a quarter or so. And they've hired me on as a, on a retainer. So for four or five gigs a quarter, I get to help their customers with culture change and leadership development. And it's, it's a fantastic, you know, yin yang and a win win. So again, thanks for asking them. I think it's, there's a lot to take away for all of us. And, and one is, you know, let's keep an even closer eye on what you're up to on your social media feeds and all that. I think you're going to be even more active and helpful. But, you know, you're a guy who knows about purpose, writes a book about purpose. And still needs to kind of pause and reflect, like, am I still living intentionally? Am I still living on purpose? And I think that's a good reminder for all of us to kind of check in with ourselves. I mean, just because we're having fun, just because things are going well, doesn't mean we shouldn't reevaluate. And that's a powerful lesson. And sometimes I think like you were in such a sweet role, you're such a sweet job. And most people would think like, he's crazy to give that up. It's, it's scary to be out on your own. It's a dangerous thing. You can do that when you're 60 or 65. Like, you know, make hay while you can. I hear that kind of stuff all the time. And yet, you know, none of us are getting any younger. And it, it's sometimes in that time of comfort and where everything is going good, I think you need to say, wait a minute, but is there something more still? And so I, I just think it's like professional courage to kind of make that change. So inspiring to, to all of us to think about it. Uh, well, here's a little anecdote. So we'll call it, well, his name's Bob. And Bob was a steel guitar player for Wilco, uh, one of the kind of greatest bands ever in my argument. I love Wilco, yeah. All right, so Bob picks up and says, you know what, uh, I need to move to Canada. So after about seven years of being a steel guitar player, he picks up, moves to Canada, and joins one of Canada's legendary bands called Blue Rodeo. Huh. And Blue Rodeo, he's got about 20, 25 years with them. So he's got this 35-ish year career playing steel guitar. He looks in the mirror. He's like, hmm, I need to do something different. I need to you know, change things up. And just outside of Toronto, he knocks on the door of a library. And he becomes its librarian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. So, you know, Bob, the steel guitar player from Wilco slash Blue Rodeo is one of those examples where I think you're right. You always have to look in the mirror and say, who am I? What am I about? And how am I going to show up each and every day? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, hey, let's shift because 
this interview, you know, we, again, we originally scheduled it last year um, when your, your new book was coming out. So it's been out for a couple months now. Again, it's open to think, slow down, think creatively and make better decisions. So give us like, what's the big idea of the book? Well, four words, really. Uh, dream, decide, do, repeat. It's, uh, I mean, I'm kind of follically challenged. So I imagine it's sort of like rinse and repeat in the shower, <laughs> but I don't uh, have hair. So here's what's happened, Kev. And when you kind of look at data, rather than just, you know, interviewing people and, and observing, as you and I are kind of, you know, organizational sociologists, right? We observe human patterns and behavior. The data tells us that mental unwellness is drastically on the rise. We both know that employee engagement hasn't really moved anywhere. Right. We see obesity levels increase. And it's kind of frighteningly sad about uh, society. And, and if we're working 40-ish hours a week somewhere at a place of work, then there's got to be some culpability with the workplace. Yeah. So, so there's that data. But then you start looking at what's happening with technology. Technology was supposed to save us, and I'm not hmm. a Luddite. Here, here we are using Zoom, having a great conversation. I'm in, up in Victoria, BC. You're in Philly. We're connected. This is fantastic, right? But somehow we lost the plot on the technology, and it's now consumed us. And so there is this attention deficit disorder that has sort of encapsulated uh, public sector and for-profit corporations, et cetera. And there's this dopamine addiction, yeah. right, to content or red check marks on your Instagram page. And, you know, I didn't get enough likes on my Facebook photo of cats playing piano and so on. And you extrapolate that inside the organization now. Okay, let's go back. Right. And you've got sort of uh, the meme, as you probably have seen and others have seen, conference call bingo. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so in these organizations, SMB, so small, medium-sized business or large or public sector, there's a lot of time spent in meetings, like lots of time. And there's this joke, right? You know, oh, I was on mute. I was on mute, right? No, no, you weren't. You were doing something else. So you're multitasking, which is another point right. uh, in the book and just the theory. And so this sense that we can multitask, that we're able to do more than one thing at once, which is utterly BS, as you know. Yeah all kind of crystallize in this, oh my gosh, like I'm a recovering chief learning officer. And I look inside these organizations and work with these C-suites and these heads of HR and these heads of learning. And I mean, it's kind of a crisis point. So the book basically says, how do we win back some time and some thoughtfulness and God forbid, mindfulness in the right. organization? Here's a, here's a line that I know you've come across, whether it's with a guest or your interviews or the consulting and the work that you do, do more with less. Like what, what does that actually mean to an employee? A leader, a C-suite executive can say, okay, we've got to cut costs by 5% this year. So we're going to nuke a bunch of employees. Uh, your OPEX is going down by another 3%. But you know what? We've got to hit that target. And our target has increased by 12%. Right. So we got 5% less employees and budget, but 12% increase in target. Do more with less now, everyone. So what do you do? Okay, Info Security Europe has found in a study of two years that uh, at least the Europeans are spending 30 minutes a day working from bed. Ugh. So why are we working from bed? Okay, A, we kid ourselves that the iPhone or the Galaxy phone or whatever you got is your alarm clock. <laughs> right. So the, you know, the Best Buy $10 alarm clock that we used to buy <laughs> is no good anymore. You've got an $800 alarm clock sitting <laughs> beside you. And then, you know, you go to bed and you, you sort of go to bed. The glowworm is looking at you and you answer those emails and you, you know, jot things down on a note because you've got to make a presentation at eight in the morning. And then you wake up and you see, oh my God, I got six texts. Right. I better answer those three from my colleague or my boss and so on and so on. Right. So this freneticism, this busyness, this overburdening distractedness on the doing is actually eliminating a lot of the pausing, the marinating in the moment, the great dreaming, the good decision making. And I think it all ends up in the soup of disarray. And again, I'm painting a somewhat cataclysmic apocalyptic view, but that's my job, not my job to paint the view. It's my job <laughs> and your job right, to observe and see what's going on. So the book is an antidote to what I think is happening. 
So let me, I don't want to derail too far off the book, but the, you just triggered some stuff. I mean, you just, hopefully our listeners will tag along and find this interesting. This whole do more with less. So off the air, I'll explain more about this, Dan, but like in the last uh, six weeks, I've probably met with 12 to 15 heads of leadership development or VPs of HR who had the responsibility for leadership development in banks, in a, a big automobile company, et cetera. Almost all of them, as we start to talk, they will say, well, Kevin, before we talk, I just want to let you know, our budgets are locked down. In fact, we have less money this year. So we are not talking about any new solutions, any new spend. And the key initiatives are improve employee engagement 10%, improve leadership, launch this. Launch. So <laughs> exactly as you're saying, they're being told they've got the same or less money but there's all these sky is falling initiatives that they're trying to tackle. Now that's bad enough. But then the third piece that they usually then talk about is, well, we already have those big online learning catalogs. I won't say them, but we all know who they are. Yeah. And it is true that only 5% of our employees ever log in in a given month. And yes, we have rolled out all those personality things and we even put them in the workshops. And we do concede that six months later, nobody can remember their four letters anymore for their personality. So I sort of start to think like, what is the madness? Like being the analytical kind of guy, I don't get it like emotionally. So I'm like, okay, wait a minute here. You don't have enough money. You've got these other initiatives and yet you're still paying for these six figure online learning catalogs that you admit 95% of the people don't use. And you admit you're sending people to these workshops, but the ebbing house forgetting curve means nobody remembers any of it six months later, but you're still buying more of those workshops. Like why, what, what's going on here? Mr. Uh, Chief learning officer, former. Yeah. <laughs> recovering. Remember recovering. <laughs> There's a clinic I go to every Friday. It cost, it cost me a grand U S for an hour. Um, Two things. One is you've heard of attribution error. It's them, not me. Of course it's them. They're not taking everything we serve up. They're not uh, learning. They're not remembering the four letters of whatever, you right. know, fill in the blank. <laughs> it can't be me. I'm the head of HR. I'm the head of learning. I'm the C-suite. I have got this approved. Of course, all of this content and all of these exercises and learning and da-da-da-da-da. It can't. So what am I getting at with the attribution error? Those women and men don't know how to say no. When I say they don't know how to say no, when you are doing a do more with less attitude, they don't know how to take off what was already on the plate. Yeah. To do do more with less, you actually have to do less. Yes. They're doing more. You have to shift your resources. You can't keep doing everything that you used to do and then add. Right. So in the case of, let's say, one of those online content providers, right? Break out of the contract, pay off half of it, whatever you got to do, and get rid of that content. And then on a three-year or five-year span, say, all right, well, we reduce that spend on the content no one uses. And then we've got this money, whether it's a mill, two, three, four, five, whatever you've spent. You're like, oh, now we can repurpose that in ways in which that maybe help mindfulness or mm -hmm. give people a little break or whatever the case may be. Yeah, yeah. I see it all the time. And particularly, funny enough, I mean... The irony, as you know, is the HR slash learning leaders are the ones supposed to be thinking about that culture and mindfulness and engagement, yet right. they do the exact opposite by piling more on. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, how come no one's taking our courses? Oh, we stirred up all this e-learning. Why is it only 5% response rate? How come people uh, haven't figured out what their you know, MBTI or DISC right. or fill in the blank is? Well, we just did that for them. Oh, it's them. It's not me. Attribution yeah. error code. Yeah, and I guess that's at all levels. I mean, and, and I think we might have even spoken about this when we were talking about one of your earlier books it are like the CEOs who are shocked when their employees don't know the company mission. They say, well, it was in our annual report or, well, I talked about it at the, our, our annual kickoff meeting. You know, they think one time is it and then it's your fault if you don't, you know, remember it. But anyway, let me, let me go back to some material from the book. You know, you, something that jumped out at me is you said we actually need to balance reflection and action. So. Tell me more about that idea. Well, any book is going to have a Venn diagram or a two by two matrix, right? I mean, it's just, otherwise you're not considered, <laughs> you better a, you're, cheap. you're not a real author. So. You'll be thrown out of the club. <laughs> so, so the last book out of Venn diagram, I was like, well, I better put a two by two matrix in this book. Oh, you're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, being self-deprecating is really the way that uh, I operate. So imagine a two by two matrix. <laughs> 
on the y axis is reflection and on the x axis is action along the bottom there and so on the bottom kind of right if you think about it that's that's where we spend way too much of our time that means we're constantly on and constantly in action mode executing like frenetic and whether it's answering all those texts mm-hmm. or whether it's all the meetings and again HBR and other groups have done great studies on the wastefulness of meetings and the number of minutes and hours wasted and so on right so at that bottom right where the action kind of block is it's just that's the big problem and i reckon somewhere between 50 to 60% of employees are there up on the top left of course is what dr ansov would refer to as paralysis by analysis mm. so that's when you're you're reflecting too much. There's a little bit too much uh, pontification and you're indecisive, let's say. So, you know, that's not a huge amount of the organization, but there's enough folks that are either fearful, scared of their boss. The culture is one that is so hierarchical, you can't move. So you're indecisive, right? And again, between that and the bottom left where you're really incapacitated and, and disconcertingly you are disengaged, if not chronically disengaged, you know, that's probably another 30-ish on those two on the, on the left and the bottom left. And the top right is really, quote, the open thinker, right? That's the individual whom says, okay, I don't need to start my day at eight o'clock with nine meetings and then it's five o'clock and then I've got an hour commute and then I'm answering voicemails with my hands-free phone on the commute home from downtown to the suburbs and now it's six o'clock and now I'm going to remember my kids' names and try to figure out if there is a soccer match or not. I don't know. And then all of a sudden it's 7.30 and it's now, okay, well, they've gone into their room, so they're playing Fortnite and I've never, okay, fine, the kids are gone. So now it's, okay, I'll get back on my laptop or my phone and now it's 7.30 to 10 and did I have a spouse? I can't, maybe, uh, she's, he's there, she's there. I don't know. Uh, now it's 1030. Well, I better get ready for bed. And now I put my phone beside my ball. I'll just answer those emails. Now it's 11 o'clock. And the same thing happens the next day. Right. Now that, again, sounds so deleterious that people have stopped listening to me in this podcast. With you, right? <laughs> and I apologize. But that's the regime. That's what's going on. Man. So, and by the way, bonus points that used Fortnite as the gaming reference. It shows you really, you are culturally aware of what those darn kids are up to these days. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to come back to this idea of open thinkers because again, you know, I'm, I'm like all about the productivity and everything, but not just to get more done, 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 but how mm-hmm. to create that balance and, and mindfulness. But the other thing that in just even more recent years, I become way more attuned to is decision making and how to make decisions like up until a few years ago, I never really thought about how I made, I, you know, you, well, yeah, listen, you know, get the data and you decide. I never knew how I did it. And I never knew there were different ways to do it and different models. So it's been like my antenna has been up. And uh, you talk about there's a way to make better decisions, different ways to think. Tell me more about that. Well, this is not design thinking. I mean, although I pay homage to my good buddy, Roger L. Martin and Tim Brown, this is not sort of the experiential thinking that Henry Mintzberg has uh, kind of come up with over the years. This is just daily thinking. It's the habitual thinking. So this is not for the ER surgeon who's going to have to make quick, thoughtful, uh, timely decisions on an operating table to save someone's life. This is more about, okay, what does my calendar look like? Have I blocked out time Mm -hmm. to process the day's actions, the day's intelligence? And so I really say, I, I think the, the second most used word in the book, by the way, is time, hmm. like thinking being the first. And on the time factor, right, again, back to my almost um, insane quip about the eight o'clock to five o'clock meetings. Well, have we built in time to make that decision or decisions? And that's about, and I loved your point about data and facts. So if you're not seeking out in the creative thinking stage, the data, the facts, the truth, the veracity, And then getting in some time to process the data, facts, veracity, et cetera. Then you just make quick decisions and you're jumping to action. So let's unravel this with um, a reference. And again, this is not about politics. This is an example, right? So I'm going to talk about a a news company called WTOE5 News. And WTOE5 News in the summer of 2016 issued a press release on their website. 
And the press release was then shared over a million times. And the press release said, Pope Francis endorses candidate Donald Trump. But if you had stopped and had a little time to process and to, to understand whether that was truthful or not, would you have shared it? Right. Because, of course, whether you're Catholic or not, popes don't endorse any candidate anywhere, right? right? And then the Vatican had to come out and issue its own press release to say, actually, we're the Vatican. We, right. we don't even endorse those in Italy that right. are running for president right, or prime minister. So that's just a little quip to say, way too often, if we're not banking and baking in, I should say, the time to take in that idea or data or fact or concept, and then, as I say in the book, marinating in the moment, quite mm -hmm. literally, for better daily habitual thinking, that's when we start losing the plot. Again, not the ER yeah, doctor yeah. who's got to save a heart valve, right? That's not it. And not when, you know, it looks like there's oncoming traffic that's about to plow into your, you know, your Ford Escape or whatever you drive. That's different. I'm yeah. talking about that, that workplace, societal, home place decision making that needs the time in which for you to make more thoughtful, better decisions. Yeah, I think that's so important. And it jumped out to me recently that, um, well, Jeff Bezos, who jumped into the news just last night uh, uh, for this recording, for other reasons, um, he talked about so much out there like hustle and get up early and blah, 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 conquer the universe. And um, he said that, you know, he, he likes to start his day around 10 a.m. <laughs> Senior level executives at his level, the main thing you do is make decisions like and the decisions you make have huge repercussions. Right. So he said that he will schedule time for his biggest decisions at 10 a.m. You know, not too early. You know, he wants to wake up and get into the morning, but not too late when, you know, the brain is uh, fatigued and, and, and all the rest. But again, to pause and to think about and to even schedule time to decide or time to go through the process of, okay, I, I got some of that data, but let me think critically about it. Let me analyze it and go through it. It's going to be so much more important as we've got this pressure to do, 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 you know, more and more. So, oh my gosh, always so much fun, but we try to keep a short-ish show. So, give us something actionable, Dan. Like, we now believe we've got to get to that magical upper right quadrant. We need to be open thinkers. We are feeling pangs as you go through these descriptions about, uh-oh, morning to night on the phone, running down the hallways. I used to be that guy running down the hallway from meeting to meeting, just not at my best. And I want to slow down and move into that quadrant. Like, Give us some things I can do, we can all do today or this week. All right. Gotcha. Uh, I'll give you three. How's that? So first, yes. win back your time. How do you win back your time? On your calendar, I'd like to see you block out Friday afternoons or don't take a meeting until 8.30 or whatever. Like On your calendar, take 30 minute or one hour segments a couple times a week or at least Friday afternoon, something that says that's me time. Win back your time and create some me time in your calendar. And again, it doesn't matter where you work, a small organization of 50 folks or you know the largest ones of 400,000. You own your calendar, so win it back. That's number one. Number two, clear the clutter. <laughs> So what does that mean? It means that if you looked on your laptop right now or your phone, what's your desktop look like? Do you have a gazillion folders and photos? And essentially I'm getting, and the same thing with apps, how many apps do you actually need? Clearing the clutter is actually becoming like a mental ninja on the technology that we're never gonna get rid of and we shouldn't, but you need to, take back control of what you actually need technologically. So is that desktop cluttered? Uh, is, uh, is your email out of control? Uh, Inbox zero is actually a thing and try to work towards that. But that's all these different concepts of clearing the clutter. You don't need the shiny object. You don't need the next new app always. And the third one which is a bit because I think we are regressing and becoming sort of 13-year-old girls and boys without a prefrontal cortex. <laughs> it doesn't really fully develop until you're 21, of course, is that we're forgetting things because of all of the different content pieces. So to be a better open thinker, we need to remember good ideas pop up throughout the day, throughout the week. 
but we'll forget them. And it's those nuggets that you need to write down. So the adage here is write it down and use something like Evernote or notes or whatever you're using on an app that you might have today, or use an actual physical book with a pen, God forbid, but they pop up. And so these little adages, quips, you know, you run into someone, you're like, oh gosh, that will help you in the creative thinking phase to make better decisions later to then, you know, execute on it. So those are the, those are the top three I'd say for today. Dan, it's uh, fantastic as always. You know, I'm just a big fan of the the work you've done. Love your books. We're like brothers from another mother on, oh. on so many of these uh, these issues. Again, the book, Open to Think, Slow Down, Think Creatively, and Make Better Decisions. Dan, what's the best way for our listeners to follow along as you're now going to be providing even more value than ever before? Well, I wish my name was like Madonna. You could just Google that. It would be way easier. I'm sure there's you might, like... You mean there's more than one Dan? Yeah, yeah. There's Dan Pink. There's... Yeah, exactly. Uh, just my name, which is rather difficult because uh, my name means broken bridge in Latin and it's hard to spell. And I'm trying to be the antithesis of my last name, Kevin. I'm trying to build bridges. Okay, anyway, it's www.dan. That one's easy. And then my last name is Pontefract, P-O-N-T-E-F as in Frank, R-A-C-T dot com. Glad you spelled it out for everybody listening. We, of course, will put the links uh, everywhere this, uh, this goes out. Dan, thanks for joining us again on the show. I look up to you, Kev. Thanks for what you're doing, mate. Thanks. Friends, if you like this episode of the LeadX Leadership Podcast, please take a minute, leave a rating on iTunes or Stitcher. Ratings are invaluable for attracting new listeners. And I like to convert those listeners into leaders because you know I'm on a mission to spark 100 million leaders in the next 10 years. And if you wanna become the boss everyone fights to work for and nobody wants to leave, check out the LeadX platform with Coach Amanda at leadx.org. And if you have 10 or more managers who could use some binge-worthy training, send me an email at info at leadx.org, L-E-A-D-X dot O-R-G, and we'll talk about getting you set up with a totally free pilot for those managers. See if they like it. If they don't, that's fine. We go away. Part as friends. But if they love it, you've just found yourself a new resource for them. Remember, leadership is influence. You're always leading. How are you going to lead today? <laughs>